two trillion dollars worth of transactions every day. Planet Earth is open for business. And it never closes. Businesses selling to consumers. Businesses selling to other businesses. The global economy is rapidly expanding. Each year, over 50 million new businesses are created. It's chaotic, hyper-competitive. From candy to concrete, from jeans to jetliners, competitors are battling on a global scale. At stake, jobs, wealth, and financial security. Even as you listen to this, there are entrepreneurs somewhere in the world that think about serving your customer better and they want to put you out of business. We've lost much of our economic clout. We are no longer the manufacturers of the world. If we don't get it right with sales, the last professional boundary uh, that drives the economic engine, so to speak, we're liable to lose it all. In the 1960s, the United States dominated the world economy. Today, our share of the pie is shrinking significantly. But in the area of sales, American companies are still seen as skillful and powerful competitors. It's really the salesperson who is the engine of the American economy. And without salespeople, the train would, would stop. Experts say it's time to fully develop the one remaining advantage we have. We need to professionalize sales. Because competing in the new global economy begins with the new selling of America. Americans have strong opinions about salespeople. Most of these attitudes grow from our experience as consumers, like buying a car. Behold the Isuzu Pup, the lowest price truck in America. About $6. Buy a pup now and you can get 3.9% financing or 500 pounds of bananas. Why, I saved enough money to buy this island and all the fish. Tenumeli Kiki Bobo. The Joe Isuzu character was created about 20 years ago. But ask Americans today to describe salespeople, and it's clear that the image hasn't changed much. Aggressive. Crooks. Driven. Pushy. Salespeople make the world go round. Very stubborn. I think they're underappreciated in this country. Bull Annoying. Pushy. Persistent. They got good jokes. Bothersome. They don't take no for an answer. Sales is probably the most misunderstood discipline in most businesses. A lot of folks think that salespeople play golf or they have lunch and take orders, and, and that job was eliminated 30 years ago. If you went back maybe five years ago, we were very product-centric, and we would focus on selling products, and what we've evolved to over the last five years is really customer focus. This isn't about you or me. This is about our customers, where they're at, and what they need to be successful going forward. That requires a relationship. That's not how Joe Azuzu would do it. What's changed? In the past, salespeople were the providers of information for the customer. And their role was more to deliver knowledge to the customer. But now with the information age, the customer has all the knowledge. So the role of the salesperson has changed into the role of the trusted advisor. We stress to our salespeople all the time that their job is to, to really search inside the customer's business, get to know it as well as they know our business, and then figure out what the customer needs. And that requires a whole new level of thinking, a business mindset, an understanding of organizational structures, understanding how things work. And that is the science of selling. Today, salespeople need analytical skills, the ability to sift through complex customer data to understand how they can best help that customer. They need to know how a business operates. They need to speak the language of business. And they need to understand customer relationship management. Salespeople aren't just selling widgets anymore. 
Experts say sales requires academic credibility, just like marketing or finance. And academic pioneers are preaching the new gospel. We have about a thousand students a year taking sales. We teach them the strategies, the processes, and tools to build deeper customer relationships. The science of selling is designed for one purpose, to better prepare salespeople to help their customers succeed. The best salespeople are not salespeople. They are specialists in helping the customer win. It's simple. Buyers want someone they can trust. They want someone who not only understands their goals, but can help achieve them. Someone like Derek Wilson. Derek is a salesperson and a sales manager with Amcom, a wholly owned subsidiary of Xerox. Amcom headquarters are in suburban Pittsburgh. My customers view me without a doubt as a trusted advisor. Territories. A casual observer might say that Derek sells copiers, but it's more complicated than that. I provide a full-blown workflow solution. Anything that delves into the creation, production, distribution, and sharing of documents and information. It's very, very competitive. Um, you have at least 15 vendors selling quote unquote what I sell. Functionality of the devices is very similar and pricing is very similar. So people have to make a decision based on intangibles outside of the traditional buying criteria. With quality and price ceasing to be differentiators, Buyers make their decision based on one dominant factor, the salesperson. People have to trust and believe that what you bring to the table puts you in a different light than everybody else. Derek does that by learning every aspect of his customer's business. And that's good news for the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh. He did an analysis of all of our copy usage across our organization and produced a report on it. It showed us how we're using our machines and, and where we're wasting money. And based upon that analysis, then he came back and said, here's how I can come in and save you money. When Derek is at the Urban League, he's wearing their uniform and playing on their team. When I made a decision to buy, I made a decision because I thought Derek was a great partner to have in business with me, and, and he's been that. It wasn't always that way. In fact, Derek had to start over. He had to relearn what he knew about selling, because when he began his career over 20 years ago, things were very different. I came from a business where it was one time, you had one time to shine, and you didn't get a chance to double back. I was thrown in downtown Pittsburgh, and I pushed a copier cart around. I was told two things. Derek, if you're not getting kicked out of a building a day, you're not doing your job, and don't come back with this copier until it's sold. It was somewhat challenging. Today, Derek doesn't push a cart, and he doesn't have to complete a sale in 60 minutes. Derek's world is about staying connected, and everything is geared toward making customer relationships unbreakable. Dave, Derek Wilson, touching base to you this morning, make sure everything's okay. Derek Wilson, of course we want to get it done this month. Can you connect me to Linda, please? Everything's good. Mr. Buter, how are you, sir? The purpose of my call is just to follow up with you, just confirming that you got everything that you needed. Okay, where's Kirkland at? Are we good to go on this? <laughs> Yeah, we're on our way to the conference now. Today, Derek is calling on Allegheny Conference, a large nonprofit organization. On this call, Derek has no intention of making a sale. My number one goal is to gain agreement uh, from Ed Buter 
that the newest solution that we put in approximately two weeks ago is doing everything that he and I felt it would. A lot of sales uh, individual sales representatives want to sell you a product. They want to show you the bells and whistles. They don't really sit down and listen to what you need. They just want to sell the latest and the greatest. Snapshot. Once Derek again, what you have, is a relationship builder, number one. Even the products aside, I look at someone that's going to be that type of person. A listener, somebody who cares, somebody who wants to stay in touch, and somebody that really, really has integrity and the knowledge to be able to implement solutions and work with me person to person. Through relationship building, Derek and Amcom have become fully integrated into the Allegheny Conference organization. The most tangible example is that when Derek comes to Allegheny Conference, he has an office with his name on the door. When he walks in, Derek is working for them. And that's really what partnerships are about. Two people sitting on the same side of the table looking to accomplish what their goals are. Um, and that's really the business that we're in versus selling a piece of equipment um, and not talking to them until the lease is over. Moving from simple transactions to being a trusted partner, Derek's career is a reflection of how sales has changed over the last 20 years. Derek was agile enough to adapt and evolve. Not everyone will be so fortunate. A high percentage of college graduates will work in sales. Most will have no preparation. Many will fail. While that's painful for the new grads, it's painfully expensive for American business. We feel like in every college graduate or new sales rep, we're investing over $100,000. Then there's no guarantee after the training that the salesperson will stay with the company because there is significant turnover in the first year. The turnover rate for young people, it's higher than we would like. It's over 50%. For both the graduates and the companies that hire them, there has to be a better way. This is a sales role-playing exercise. It's being videotaped so it can be reviewed and critiqued. Like a football game film, it will be broken down, analyzed, and used as a learning tool. Down the hall, people are making sales calls. At 5 o'clock, there's a major business meeting. Critical issues will be discussed. Decisions will be made. A Fortune 500 company? Not exactly. New York, Chicago, LA? Not even close. We're in the foothills of Appalachia. This is Ohio University. The business people are students and they're working at well, they're actually running the Ralph and Lucy Shea Sales Center. There are over 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States. Ohio University has one of a tiny but growing number of academic sales programs. Katie Rio is a junior from Silver Springs, Maryland. Throughout my whole life, I wanted to be a lawyer. My family and all my family friends would say, Katie, you need to pursue a career in law. And when I got to school and I started getting into some of my business law classes, I realized it wasn't quite for me. Amber Fox is a senior from Columbus, Ohio, majoring in business and marketing. She was also looking for the best path to her future. When I chose business and marketing, I really had no clue what direction I wanted to go. But when I got into the sales center at Ohio University, I started to realize that sales would be the best career path for me. After dropping law, Katie Rio had a decision to make. I decided to double major in marketing and finance. I really like that creative aspect and thinking of new ideas. Um, I really like the analytical side and analyzing different situations. 
I really enjoyed the art of persuasion, but it wasn't until I really found sales that I was able to apply all three of those into one career. The Ohio University Sales Center program requires the completion of 28 credit hours. Can you handle objections? Are you going to freeze when somebody says, I don't like your product or I don't need your product? Would that hurt your pride? Yeah. But are they saying they're not going to buy? Somebody says, I don't need your product. What do you think? Is that saying no? Do you think buyers are ever trained that they're going to question you and challenge you? Well, we're going to welcome objections. For all the professional caliber course content, a key component of the Sales Center program is the out-of-the-classroom activities. Every week, we have a Monday night meeting, which is kind of our weekly sales meeting. Sales Center rookies quickly learn the value of the program from those who understand it best. But it's also a great way for you when you're going into your interviews, whether it's for an internship or a job, to say, hey, you know, I've been taking these sales classes, I've been going to these professional development events, but it actually pays off. The payoff comes in the form of internships and jobs. As the Monday meeting is planned, time is set aside to announce the names of students who have already accepted offers of employment. Talking about that, she's going to intern with Marriott Vacation Club. Todd got a job with National City. Is the one that yeah, he's taking National City. Burns his paychecks. Megan is EMC and Julie, Microsoft. Yep. Okay. Whether it's running the sales meeting, making presentations, creating the website, or organizing charity events, there's no doubt who's making it happen. It's the students um, that come up with the ideas, the students who own the ideas, and the students who implement the ideas and make sure they get carried out. So think about what we talked about. If you go to that buyer role play outline, we actually Success in sales means knowing how to sell. Role plays provide essential training. Uh, we've drafted up our formal proposal that we've okay. put together for you to take a look at. Sometimes sales role plays can be pretty nerve-wracking. Are you guys um, ready to make a decision today? Um, you know, we, we've talked about it quite a bit, and we think that you're offering a great program to us, but it's just such a big endowment that we're working with. It's such a large decision. To be honest, we're a bit worried. Um, your natural tendency is to get a little bit nervous. That's the idea. The Sales Center program is designed to throw the students into uncomfortable situations where they learn to think on their feet, like making cold calls to corporate executives. Making those calls in the beginning was very difficult. I still remember one of the executives that I first called to try to get her to attend um, one of our programs for senior level executives for professional development. I didn't really know much about the Sales Center at the time because I had just gotten into the program. She completely was unwilling to speak with me on the phone. I didn't really know what I was doing and explaining to her, so I was taking up her time. And when I got off the phone, essentially I started crying. Looking back on that experience, I can see my growth from that first time last spring to now. Well, we're calling today to let you know that the like OU Sales Center is overview offered of the program. Program. You'll discover that this program, you along with its strategies and tools, I'd just like to thank you for coming down to Ohio University. For the so why are 20-year-old college students calling corporate executives? It's not only an academic program, but it's also a student-run organization. We like to refer to it as running our own business. Hi. For example, I was the corporate development director this year, and essentially my role was to go out and find companies to become corporate members. All right, a few more updates. We've signed two new corporate members, so we have a grand total of 34. So a round of applause is great. Now we're a completely self-funded program. So basically what a corporate membership is a company that pays anywhere from $5,000 to $25,000 a year to come down and recruit our students. You don't get that kind of money over the phone. We actually take the sale on the road and go to different cities and present to different companies about what the sales center is and how it can be beneficial to them. We want you to bring that to us so that we are also able to offer you great students for great sales careers. We all get experience through being able to go and sell the sales center really gave us that real-world experience of calling CEOs and CSOs of huge corporations and trying to get them to come down to Athens, Ohio and meet our real product, which is our students. Beyond the required 28 credit hours, Sales Center students must complete a 300-hour internship. I'm going to work for Cardinal Health, 
as a pharmaceutical distribution salesperson. I know precisely what, what I want to do with Cardinal Health because of my internship with them. I really saw what I thought would be the best fit for me. This summer I will be interning with a company called EMC, which is in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm really excited. Part of me is nervous because I'm not from Boston. I'm from Maryland and it is my last summer at home that I could have spent with my family, but at the same time it was such a great opportunity and I think it's a really great chance for me to learn even more being out in the real world. Just how well did the OU Sales Center experience prepare them for the real world? Over the next few weeks, Amber Fox and Katie Rio will find out. In the evolution of sales in America, Katie Rio and Amber Fox are examples of a relatively recent phenomenon. For much of our history, selling was considered a man's job. Even when America leapt into the industrial age, the typical large corporation was hiring men only for their sales force. Another contrast, education. Early salesmen, like peddlers, had little or no education and their only training was what they learned on the job. In the 1800s, America was a rural nation. Frontier communities were isolated. Today, we talk about emerging global markets. Through the 1800s, the emerging opportunities were found on the American frontier. And that's where you'd find the peddler. Peddlers were a fixture in early American history. They traveled throughout the country. They sold goods like uh, buttons or combs, rakes. Peddlers were especially important because America is such a huge and expansive country. They united the cities and the rural agricultural areas. Peddling, uh, like almost all forms of selling, faced negative stereotypes. The peddler very quickly in American history was almost always portrayed as an outsider who came to town and tricked people into buying things. Ladies, ladies, I have some oriental... But despite the negative stereotype, the peddler network was about to become even more important. In the early 1800s, something happened in Connecticut that would keep the peddlers busy for some time to come. And for peddlers seeking a desirable product to sell, it was about time. Prior to 1800, clocks were primarily the uh, toys of the wealthy. A uh, grandfather clock would uh, have cost uh, in the range of 50 to 70 dollars. So clocks were indeed a great deal of money. Clocks were expensive because they were made by hand, one clock at a time. It was extremely labor intensive. Eli Terry, a Connecticut clockmaker, revolutionized the process. He used gears made of wood, and he designed machines that accurately produced interchangeable parts. Eli Terry is the man probably most responsible for the Industrial Revolution in America. The clock is really one of the first new items that salesmen promote throughout the nation. Following the clock come the sewing machine, the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, uh, and then early automobiles are also sold door to door, especially the Chevrolet model. So the clock is important because it sets this precedent for what comes next. An English traveler named Featherstone Baugh came to this country in 1840, and in his memoirs he wrote that in every home in Missouri, in every dell in Arkansas, in every house where there wasn't even a chair to sit on, there was sure to be a Connecticut clock. Eli Terry's factory near Bristol, Connecticut was the first example of mass manufacturing in North America. But a flood of clocks didn't do much good unless they could be transported to markets and sold. That's where the peddlers came in. The peddler, if he had a reluctant customer, he would try to leave the clock with them 
uh, asked them to do him a favor. He would tell the farmer that he just wanted to store a clock there for a few months, um, not intending to sell it. He would put it on the wall and start it. When he came back a few months later, he knew that they would have to keep it. Well, the luxury once enjoyed is rarely given up. Peddlers were the first to bring mass-produced goods to the American frontier, essential for the growing economy. But they were still viewed as shady characters. The real effort to improve the image of the salesman comes with the drummers or traveling salesmen in the late 19th century. Most people think the term drummer came from the idea that they drummed up trade. Drummers traveled around, often spending months on trains, uh, taking orders from country stores and sending them back to their wholesalers to be filled. The drummer was quite a different figure from the peddler. The drummer tended to be married, tended to be older, more educated. The drummer wants to establish long-term, year-after-year relationships with the store owner. In their efforts to win the favor of store owners, drummers found humor to be a useful tool. People normally think that traveling salesman jokes are about traveling salesmen and farmers' daughters. But there's another side to the story. If you look at the history of drummers, you see a lot of joke books being published in the late 19th and early 20th century that are written for drummers. These are jokes that they could memorize and tell shop owners and thereby gain their friendship. Drummers needed goods to sell, and American factories were filling the order. Mass production was changing the way America did business. One captain of industry sought to apply the same controls and efficiencies of mass production to the sales process. John Henry Patterson was a pioneer who started the National Cash Register Company. And he had a sales force of about 2,000 people, and he invented many of the modern selling techniques. Patterson is a very important figure in the history of selling. Patterson unites it all. He makes sales quotas, divides the country up into sales territory. He creates a training program for his sales force. He pushes them to dress well. He pushes them to memorize a primer, a sales script. John Handy Patterson's view was that if you can systematize selling, you're going to be more effective. And he sent out people to watch sales presentations, and he had them all transcribed, and then he compared all the best practices and came up with the primer. It's a sales manual for NCR salespeople. And then he hired elocutionists to teach salespeople on how to deliver the script. So salespeople became sort of verbal artists and the company was incredibly successful. And a lot of other companies copied the Patterson approach. He tries to improve the motivation of his sales force by holding large conventions. It really fits into Patterson's plan quite well. First of all, you're giving people things to say. You're telling them which territory to work. You're telling them how much to sell. The next thing is you have to find a way to motivate them. And the convention does that very well. So if you succeed, you get treated quite well at NCR. Patterson Century Point Club, or CPC, recognized salesmen who achieved 100% or more of their quota. The salesmen were brought in from around the world to NCR headquarters in Dayton, Ohio, and treated like royalty. For Patterson, it was a chance to educate, entertain, and celebrate success. And it's still done today. Today, many corporations hold conventions to celebrate and reward the success of their salespeople. That started with Patterson. He elevated the importance of the salesman. Other companies followed his lead. As salesmen evolved, new tools were developed to support their mission. Sales training classes became commonplace. Companies created newspapers for their salesmen as a way to dispense useful advice. <laughs> 
Later, companies produced instructional films expressly for their sales force. And motivation merged with entertainment as salespeople and their products were immortalized in song. So just at the point at which American companies are employing and training salesmen to go around the world to sell their goods, the salesman is also escalating in American culture. But the role of salesman as hero was never really embraced by the American public. Many saw salesmen merely as performers in search of a buck. In the 50s, salespeople were trained to verbalize a pitch so salespeople were thought of as like actors who can deliver the lines, and if they deliver the lines well, they're going to be successful. Take principle number one here, for example. Don't sell the steak, sell the sizzle. It's the sizzle that sells the steak and not the cow. Hidden in everything you sell in life is a sizzle. The sizzle is the tang and the cheese, the crunch and the cracker, the whiff and the coffee, and the pucker and the pickle. Increasingly, some people felt manipulated and misused by admin, salesmen, and big business in general. In 1949, Arthur Miller's play, Death of a Salesman, won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. The main character, Willie Loman, is an aging traveling salesman who's lost his grip on reality. His drive to achieve success has left him hopelessly tangled in a web of lies, delusions, and self-deceptions. As a salesman, his entire foundation was based on a shoe shine and a smile. What happens when they don't smile back, Willie Loman asks? What happens when people don't buy your products? What happens when the products fail? What happens when you yourself become a product that the company no longer wants? I think salespeople might still be living under the shadow of Willie Loman, or at least the image of salespeople is. He's, of course, the first salesperson you think of when, when the word comes up. But he's not the only salesperson we remember. For many people, encounters with telemarketers and other high-pressure salespeople create a more immediate stereotype. The public holds such a persistently negative view of salespeople because we've all been sold to and we've all been sold to poorly. Today, especially in the business-to-business -business environment, salespeople are expected to be trusted advisors. Why? That's what their customers demand. It's not the old Willie Loman type, here are my products, please buy one of these two, I'll call you next week. Those kind of days are over in the professional business selling environment. We really are asking our organization to evolve into much more than just a sales organization. It's the relationship management, it's understanding the business processes that the customer has. So this is really evolving into a solution-oriented job versus just a sales job. Now, we all have quotas and we all have numbers that we need to hit, so it is still, let me be very clear, it is still a sales organization. But the way we go about delivering it is not for just a quarterly sale, it's for the long-term gain of both AT&T and the customer. We're out changing the way people sell. Typically, you have these stereotypes of salespeople, and we're out working with students to get them to understand that there is a science to selling. The science of selling requires that salespeople understand and master many diverse business skills. To be a trusted advisor, they must become an integral part of their customer's business. That requires a level of expertise. But business experts see the science of sales extending beyond the customer relationship. They say that science can enhance the efficiency of the entire sales organization. Most sales organizations are not sophisticated. It's not formalized. And I think that's what the real interesting issue is. The formalization of sales as a function. Right, it's like having a Nighthawk guitar player, right? A guy that can play without music, play without having anything in front of him and has learned by picking it up, and he's a damn good musician. 
but when you start playing in a symphony, you definitely need notes. Right? You need a conductor, you need something that's working together in a very complicated symphony. And everyone's on the same page. Erika van der Linde Feidner knows the complexities of music. She also knows how to sell. She was the top salesperson at Steinway & Sons worldwide for eight consecutive years. Then she started her own company called Piano Matchmaker. While the business world is moving toward relationship selling, Erika is already there. She has an uncanny ability to deliver exactly what her customers want even when they are unable to articulate what that is. Over her career, Erica has sold $42 million worth of pianos. I began playing the piano at the age of three. At the age of 11, I received a full scholarship to the Juilliard School of Music in the pre-college division. And some people sort of look at me like, well, you lived in Vermont. <laughs> and the truth is, yes, I skip school every Friday to get on a bus to New York City, have classes all day, and head home. I did that for about four years. That's when I began doing some performing. I was the soloist with the Vermont Symphony when I was 11. I was crowned Miss Vermont 1985. <laughs> and won a talent award at the Miss America pageant in 1986. And with my winnings, I was able to purchase my first piano. After my college years and earning my Bachelor in Fine Arts, um, I really wanted to take a different direction, and that was in business. I've just always had an entrepreneurial spirit so I earned my MBA in marketing. I began working at a piano shop, and I was happy enough to combine business and piano. My father, on the other hand, had full expectations that I was going to be a concert pianist. And we sort of grew apart a little bit. Erica pursued her business goals with the same passion she displayed in her performances. Choosing a piano is very much like choosing a partner or a companion. And in doing so, it's a, it's a major decision and we want to get it right the first time. Many people don't realize that each piano sounds and feels different from one another. Pianos are made of 85% wood, which is an organic material. And even if a manufacturer uses the same kind of wood for each piano, every tree in the world is different even if the species is the same. And in the end, you're going to have a different quality of sound. If I can't show you the difference, I haven't done my job, and I can't have you choose a piano with me until you understand. I'm excited to be on my way to Stanford to meet a client by the name of Mike Daly, and he is a staunch beginner and is not familiar with um, how a piano is made or built. He doesn't know yet that each one sounds and feels different, and I'm really looking forward to introducing him to the, the world of the piano, essentially. Mr. Daly, I'm Erica Feidner. Very nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. Erica you begins by asking questions. She's looking for clues that reveal her client's personality. I look at their body language. I listen to their tone of voice. I get certain vibes from people right away, and as I'm speaking with them, um, a list of inventory and hundreds of pianos and sounds and, and just um, the experience of certain pianos will go through my mind. But when a piano is born, it's got its own set of DNA. We are playing on the black keys. It's very spirited. Acoustics. Yes. So you'll have much more dynamic range and color. Now, if you'll hop up for one second. She's in the business of matching a piano's personality to that of the user, which sounded unique, and uh, it was thought-provoking and fun. Boing, 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 boing. It should be fun. 
and there's no corporate income tax in Estonia. She's brimming over with information, and she leads you to that information in a fun and a kind of wondrous fashion. The fourth and the seventh notes of the scale are absent, but there's something else going on. Come right out over here. It has exceeded my expectations, and um, I think everyone should start this way. I think all of that is a credit to Erica. Is that where you are, or are we over in the $70,000 range? $70,000, that's, that's a lot of notes, isn't it? <laughs> I have matched about 1,000 people with what I consider the perfect piano for them. I remember working with a psychotherapist from California, and we found such a great piano for her. And I said, would you like to play the piano one more time? And she said, no, I'm afraid to. And I said, my goodness, why is that? And she said, because it's a reflection of me. It was so potent what she said, and that's really what it was all about. Um, she wasn't really afraid, she was just so stunned that it was a reflection of her personality that uh, she was just shaken. And I then said, well, congratulations. And the piano went home. Erica's track record places her in the ranks of the elite. She's among the most successful salespeople in her industry. But Erica is painfully aware of how sales is viewed by the public. And that's why, for Erica, the word itself strikes a dissonant chord. What I do is to match an instrument to the person and the person to the piano. Um, as far as the process, the process itself is unique. But in the end, they are making a purchase. So in that sense, it's a sale. But to me, sale is almost a four-letter word. Right down the tube. Whatever you call it, because it's I clear that Erica's clients you. see her as a trusted oh, advisor. Okay, well, Why aren't there more salespeople like her? An article in the New Yorker magazine put it this way, Erica Feidner has a gift. No one who experiences it seems to forget it. To me, it just goes off like a light bulb, and um, that's the best way I can explain it. In the evolution of sales, Erica and others like her occupy a specialized branch near the top of the tree. I'm good, how's your piano? You can't build a sales force of Erica Feidner's because there are simply too few of them. They account for a tiny fraction of all salespeople. And what they do is not easily duplicated by others. But buyers, both consumers and corporate, are looking for the level of expertise, passion, and professionalism that salespeople like Erica can deliver. And sales managers are desperate to build a sales team with these same characteristics. The question is, where will these super salespeople come from? Experts say, if we want to create large numbers of world-class salespeople, it needs to begin here, at American colleges and universities. We have about 16 uh, million salespeople in the United States. And every year, American industry wants to hire two or three million new salespeople. You look at the 4,000 colleges across the country, only a small percentage, only 35 of them, teach selling as a degree. But those 1,500 salespeople that graduate, they all know how to make a cold call, how to write a sales letter, how to close a sale how to use sales technology. They all know how to relate to the customer and be in sync with the customer. And companies are happy to reward employees with those kinds of skills. You can make a lot of money in sales. People don't understand that this isn't just the old days of used cars or door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner sales. Many of them will come back and say, wow, I had no idea that I would get this kind of an opportunity. We even find individuals being recruited at the end of their junior year, a year before they're going to graduate, 
and you won't find that in almost any other area in school except possibly sports. A lot of them can advance faster in their careers, so it makes only sense to create a partnership between business and colleges. Strong advocacy groups are emerging to support this movement. One is the University Sales Center Alliance. Founded in 2002, the group's goal is to advance the sales profession through academic leadership. Alliance members are quick to point out that faced with shrinking budgets, American colleges can also benefit from partnerships with business. If we're able to bring a set of partner companies to a university, and these partner companies are not only hiring our grads, but giving back to the university to fund some major initiatives, then it's a real win for the university. But Katie Rio and Amber Fox are likely to argue that the biggest winners are the students. I've been working at Cardinal Health full-time now for three months. Um, I was an intern last summer. I'm a sales development analyst, and what that is is a year-long rotational program, uh, four rotations that are each three months long. The four rotations expose the new hires to different aspects of the company. It's basically a year of sales training. Hi, Tony. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. Um, One of the projects we're working on right now in the training rotation is developing an onboarding checklist. So what we've been doing is hosting conference calls with sales managers and above and hearing about what their best practices are for onboarding and training a new hire. How about the sales process? Um, what would you like to see in training around the sales process, especially for a new hire? Some areas of improvement would be around pipeline management. Okay. Uh, I think everybody thinks of, of new business and, and now getting them geared towards existing business uh, and opportunities within that I think has been the biggest area that we need to focus on. Okay. Amber's doing a fantastic job. She is really a great team player. Uh, Amber is also results driven and you can really see evidence of that at some of our higher level meetings. Amber is able to move into those meetings very successfully and to uh, add value. I'll be in meetings with directors or VPs and I feel like I portray myself and I've been told I portray myself very confidently and able to get my ideas across and my opinion across. How about the next slide here? Is, I like this. What was your idea behind this? Um, well, the why now component is something that we used for all the offers within Cardinal Health in the sales field, so we really wanted to make it um, as consistent as possible. So that was the idea, and it it's something that's going to aid them when they go and talk to their customers. Throughout this year of training, Amber meets frequently with her boss to evaluate her progress. The team feels one of your strengths is, is your business acumen and how you've been able to quickly learn the Cardinal culture, learn our businesses, learn our terminology. So. Great job. There is one thing that Amber needs to manage better. Time. I'm always late. <laughs> I'm still on the 10 after schedule, I think, from OU. <laughs> there really haven't been any surprises since I started in the sales development program. Actually, one of the benefits of the sales center is you're required to do an internship. So I chose to do mine at Cardinal Health. Got a lot of experience with what I'd be doing in the sales development program. Um, so I felt pretty comfortable when I accepted the position that I had a pretty good idea of what I'd be doing this next year. When she graduates from the program and gets out into the field, she'll be able to move into a pharmacy consultant position and really impact our bottom line. 800 miles from Columbus, another sales center student is seeing how she measures up in the business world. I'm in Boston now and I'm really enjoying it. My internship this summer is with EMC Corporation. The first day went really well and then um, after that it got a little bit more challenging. We're not treating an intern um, as, I guess, what you might say a traditional intern. Our interns take on the role of a sales associate. They really give you a lot of ownership and put it in front of you and you know see what you can make of it. And by doing that, by the end of their internship, they understand and we understand whether they're a right fit. A right fit is someone who embraces the entrepreneurial nature of sales with its inherent risks and responsibilities. The reason why you choose sales is because you're gonna get out on the skinny branches. You're responsible for your own success. Trying to get your company to right. and I already kind of have, pick uh, up the inquiries yeah. into the right right parties. Hey, so Justin, you should be you gathering. I'm pretty fired up for this project we were talking about. I'm passionate about seeing someone go from zero 
to an articulate, confident individual in a very short period of time. Cold calling is a true test of confidence, and it's a required part of the sales associate program. Hi, Jerry. This is Katie Rio calling with EMC Corporation. How are you doing today? Hey, Katie. Pretty good, thanks. Good. Well, the reason I'm calling today is because I've actually worked with a number of manufacturers. Basically, your overall goal Very is to get an appointment for the outside rep to come in and see if we can provide a solution for those customers. The call is monitored, and soon after, Katie's performance is reviewed. Hey, Katie. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you? Good. So, Katie, uh, great job with the call. What I loved was that you went right into the impact statement. Uh, you discussed the research that you've done about the company. Uh, you've discussed some of their competition and some of the trends that you've seen in other manufacturing companies. So, perfect. That's what, that's what you want to start out with. Uh, some of the things that I noticed is that we need to have a little bit more practice in it is telling a story with the customer. You know, not going through a list of questions, uh, trying to find out information, but actually have a discussion with them. Trying to have a more engaging conversation with the customer and, um, you know, have it more interactive between the two of you. But great okay. job, though. Thanks, Sherry. I will say that my training from the sales center kind of prepared me for that because I've made cold calls for them before, so it made me a little bit more comfortable once I actually got on the phones. Much of the training at EMC is designed to get the new hires outside of their comfort zone. Within three to four weeks of being hired, new sales associates give a presentation in front of their peers. On Tuesday, I will be giving my fireside speech. The fireside pitch is a three to five minute elevator pitch on our company. What we do, how we do it why it's important to customers. You can't have any notes in front of you. The reason we're doing that is we're getting them out of their comfort zone. And it's a milestone for them. If they can accomplish this, it gives them a lot of confidence to move forward. And we certainly build upon that as they go through the program. And we're gonna kick it off with Katie Rio. I've been practicing a lot for the speech. But unless you're really giving it in front of groups of people, you never really know what's going to happen. So what does that mean for you? It means if you join the EMC ranks, you have access to the world's best IT solutions. Now these are just a few ways we add value to our total customer experience. Some other ways is through our five nines guarantee, meaning 99.999% of the time, your systems will be up and running, eliminating downtime to make sure your business is as productive as possible. The next step is getting our two technical Technical teams together to evaluate a couple of stumbles kept Katie from her goal of delivering a perfect presentation. Effective solution. Will, how's Tuesday at two? In the hallway, the judges compare notes. The presenters are ranked. It's a competitive group, and getting first place is a major accomplishment. I came in third place. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with how I did. Of course, there was definitely things I could have worked on. I had a few hiccups during the speech, but overall I'm happy. But of course, there was many things I could have improved upon. You finished third place, which is, which is pretty outstanding. You did a fantastic job, especially considering you're an intern and you went up against people, full-time hires, okay? Um, the quality of the recruits that we're about, getting from the sales center uh, are really a, a notch above those we get from most other universities. Uh, reason being, they've already made the decision that they want a career in sales. Uh, they've gone through four years of training in the sales profession, uh, and they're that much ahead of the rest of the game when, when graduating from college. The, the results speak for themselves, and it's a win-win for both the uh, employee and for the company. In August, Katie Rio left Boston to return to Athens for her senior year at Ohio University. She left with the knowledge that she had a job waiting for her upon graduation. Amber and Katie are the new sales professionals, but they're just two of over two million salespeople that will be hired this year. The question remains, can sales reinvent itself? And can the change happen quickly enough to make a difference? The internet has forever changed the traditional role of the salesperson. In a highly competitive environment where companies are desperate to grow revenue, it is the salesperson who can provide an advantage by serving their customers as a trusted advisor. 
That is the new role of the sales professional. The growing alliance between education and business is steadily marching toward the professionalization of sales. But the rest of the world is catching up quickly. At stake is our ability to compete in a rapidly changing world. To learn more about university sales programs, visit saleseducationfoundation.org. To order your DVD copy of New Selling of America for $19.95 plus shipping and handling, call 1-800-776-4436 or order online at www.saleseducationfoundation.org.